Hey folks, welcome to your study of the new era, the 1920s, and that'll take us also into the Great Depression. So this unit, or this chapter, is titled The New Era and the Great Depression. Uh, we'll start with the new, uh, the new era of the 1920s. First, here's your uh, objectives for the unit. And moving on. Uh, this is the beginning of a new America. We are fresh out of World War One. We we go to Europe, and uh, the few men that we do contribute tribute to the AEF, the American Expeditionary Forces, uh, change the tide of battle, and then they come home heroes, handicapped heroes, but heroes nonetheless. And so the country is moving now. We're no longer considered a developing nation. We are now a strong urban industrial nation, and the people of that nation have this strong nebulous belief that the United States has entered a period of sustained peace and plenty. Uh, let's take a look at... Uh, the word nebulous. Uh, this this definition here, though, is very ironic. For the for a generation that will encounter the Great Depression and World War II, for such a strong belief that that we've entered a period of peace and plenty, they experienced two of the most uh, disastrous events uh, probably in their life. Real quick, uh, the definition of neb nebulous meaning <clears throat> hazy, vague, or confused. So they have this hazy or confused belief. Almost delirium uh, belief that the United States has entered a period of peace and plenty. Causes of this belief, causes for their delirium, uh, life is better. Manufacturing is up 64%. Wages are up 11%. 85% of the people in the United States have electricity, and uh, a third of the farmers have electricity by the Great Depression. We'll get into the, When we get into the New Deal, we'll talk about how the government... Uh, fixed uh, the the remaining two-thirds of the farmers. Um, advertising is growing. Um, it's not necessarily just to advertise for sales, but now we start to advertise for ways of life, housing and clothing and lifestyles and entertainments. Um, along the lines of uh, this, uh, this increase in manufacturing, we can see that uh, jobs are pretty steady with uh, wages increasing, and so uh, sixty percent of the families can afford a car without causing them to go without other things. Um, at the beginning of the uh, assembly line period, you can see a Model T costs around a thousand dollars higher end, uh, eight fifty basic model. But in nineteen twenty five, because of mass production, economies of scale, a higher end Model T can cost a family three hundred seventy five dollars, or a basic model two hundred fifty dollars. Um, again, mass, mass production allows for that. Same thing we see in refrigerators. Instead of uh, the old-fashioned ice box, which my grandparents had, uh, we have these new electric refrigerators. At the beginning of the manufacture, they cost $900. Uh, kind of pretty big chunk of change. I mean, you can get a decent refrigerator for $900 today. But again, economies of scale, uh, refrigerator is now available to the general public for $180. A good radio costs 25 bucks by 1925. Two million American homes have radios. Uh, this becomes extremely important during the Great Depression because Franklin Roosevelt uses the radio to get messages out to the public uh, as a way to uh, calm their fears, so to speak, about the, the economy. Um, and then we see the development of other modern-day appliances, appliances that make life easier, uh, such as the steam iron, the toaster, and the vacuum. Um, if you have a chance and you're looking at the regular Prezi, not the audio Prezi, um, take a look at this inf inflation calculator. It gives you an idea of uh, what things cost then compared to what things cost today. It's kind of neat to type in some information there. Uh, in regards to World War One, this is, you know people come out of this war with uh, pretty high morale in the United States because we did help out, as I said earlier. Uh, the United States was very influential in helping the war, and so after the war, we see the economy booming. Well, the U.S. economy booms because the European economy is in shambles. Germany is in complete disarray. The Treaty of Versailles did did a great job of punishing the the German economy and the German government. Uh, there's no way the German government is going to get out of debt anytime soon. I think it's just recently, you know, like 2000 and oh, I don't know, 2010, where Germany finally paid off their debts, I, I believe. I could be a little wrong on that, but it's it's been that long. Uh, so Germany's in shambles, England's in shambles, France, uh, all the European countries are in shambles. The United States is the only healthy industrial um, product, pro producer in the world, So, or producer, I should say, in the world. So it's no wonder that our economy booms. Um, again, the assembly line leads to a vast development of all kinds of manufactured goods, and we sell them to European countries. 
and we we enjoy that uh, trade for a long period of time. Now, because of the success of the auto industry, uh, we see the other industries growing. Because if you look at the auto industry, and I'm looking at number two right now, or two letter eyes, um, auto auto industry uses steel, rubber, glass, and other tools to help with their manufacturers. So those industries grow. The indust oil industry grows due to gas consumption. Um, road construction creates jobs. And new transportation creates jobs. It's the basic business cycle. If people are working, people are spending money. People spend money. Uh, that allows other companies to hire and create jobs. The more jobs are created, the more people who have jobs, the more people who have jobs, the more people who spend money. And there we have a completion of the cycle. That is the way things work in a really, really good, stable economy. And that's the way it was in the 20s for the most part. Uh, when we get into the Great Depression, we'll see that the economy starts to slow down because construction slows down. We'll talk a little bit more about construction here in a second. Um, or we'd ha we have talked about construction uh, earlier in the semester, how housing starts to slow down, auto industry slows down. So when those industries slow down, then we see a laying off of the workers. People get laid off, they don't spend as much. If they don't spend as much, local stores can't don't sell as much, then they have to lay off workers. The more workers who get laid off, the fewer, the less amount of money that they are spending in the markets we see. Again, it's just the business cycle, but it's the downside of the business cycle. So one of the reasons why people believe that things are good is because they think government has this whole business cycle figured out. Um, during the war, women take jobs that men left open to go fight in Europe, and uh, they, they enjoyed some success there, though um, after the war, it, it's kind of divided. 60% of the women wanted to give up those jobs. 40% of the women wanted to keep those jobs. Nevertheless, the majority of those women are forced out of those jobs to give the jobs back to men. But we do see an increasing number of work for women in what we call pink collar. So now we have blue collar jobs. You know, that's where you get your hands dirty. We have white collar jobs. That's more of the professional line. Uh, women in work, more pink collar jobs, telephone operators, sales clerks, secretaries, things like that. Very, very underpaid for all that they have to do and everything they have to go through. 25% um, of the married women work outside the home. Professional women, again, still confined to stereotypical roles of, of teacher, social worker, nurses, etc. Very few get into owners or business. We have some lower level business management, but again, even those women were treated very, very poorly. Again, uh, in reflection of the progressive reforms, progressives feel like the all of their issues have been solved or resolved, so to speak, and so the the worst of the situations are over. And we also see a changing role of religion as people start to enjoy this new life, new comfortable life. They start to get away from their morals and values. And it's not not every American. That's kind of a generalized statement. Not every American does it. Actually, most Americans actually stop short from teaching the the beliefs of the Bible. Uh, there's still that being taught in the home. But you know, we see Sunday as less of a holy day and more of a day of, uh, hey, let's go spend the afternoon in the park or go let's go ride bikes or let's go take in a movie. So some of these uh, entertainment-type activities are replacing church and family time at home. Again, people believe that the government and uh, business has figured out this business cycle. And it is actually quite simple. As long as people have jobs and put put money into the economy, the business cycle works and, and the, the economy works. Uh, one of the downfalls to the Bush and Obama uh, bailout plan, specifically Bush, they, he wanted to give families x amount of dollars in a check and they 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 made it very clear uh, don't put this in the bank spend this money because they were trying to kickstart the economy um, so they understand but it, that, it just obviously it didn't work <clears throat> um, because of the business cycle appearing to be uh, fixed and and, and regulated uh, we see consumer confidence is up and this this is where we start to see uh, stores like sears and montgomery ward start to offer consumers the ability to purchase on credit. So you put a little bit of money down, you take the item home, and then you make regular monthly payments to that store. And this is all well and good as long as you continue to have a job and you continue to make money. As we see the Great Depression, the business cycle slowing down, the economy slowing down, people lose their jobs, then they don't have the money to pay back those credit loans. Let's take a little social look at the uh, conditions, of the social conditions of the 1920s, I should say. 
Um, through uh, the 1840s, uh, the, the main source of information came through print media. 1880s, um, new goods, new services were a big hit. The industrial in, industrial era was uh, was in full swing there. So we're getting new goods and services. And then by the 1920s, uh, entertainment was the big thing, as I mentioned earlier. Movie theaters. We see an increase in magazine and book sales. Book of the Month Club uh, begins. You know, Reader's Digest has this Book of the Month Club. If you if you join it, you get a new book each month. And so that was a new big thing. Uh, women's magazines becomes become pretty popular at this time as well. Again, advertising I mentioned earlier. Advertising is not just for sales of food items, but it also becomes a way to advertise for a uh, a lifestyle, so to speak. And again, radios by 1925, two million households have radios. Um, forty percent of the households by the Great Depression have have radios. Again, this is used very widely by Franklin Roosevelt to get his messages out. Uh, specifically in movies, the entertainment movies become uh, probably the number one form of entertainment. Po- adults go about once a week. Kids more often. Uh, in Muncie, Indiana alone, there were nine theaters. Now, to give you an idea why this is important, Muncie, Indiana, at this time in the 1920s, had about a population of about 23,000 people. Nixa enjoys a population of about 19,000. Nixa has how many theaters? Oh, yeah, that's right, none. We share one with that town to the east of us. Muncie, Indiana has nine. And those nine theaters, uh, I don't know that each theater changes their uh, bill, so to speak, or their um, main show three times a week. But within these theaters, you can get 22 different movies uh, each week. Uh, Films are short, 75 minutes. They cost 5 to 10 cents or 25 cents depending uh food pretty cheap but again at the same time 10 cents back then was a pretty big deal back then back today 10 cents back then was a pretty big deal like it is today it would be like 20 you know probably 10 15 dollars uh today and most of the most of these theaters around the country were palace type theaters with this new fancy air conditioning and the ushers were all decked out uh, we see egyptian modus because our motifs because this is when right around the time when King Tut's tomb was discovered and then the whole rumor of King Tut's curse was out there so that was the big theme that was the big draw um, and so that was how the uh, the movie theaters were decorated out and then we see uh, a moving of in the youth itself into flappers and vamps we'll take just a second here uh, to look at it um, social heroes Social heroes are Charles Lindbergh, Babe Ruth, Charles Atlas. But the youth culture, the vamps and the flappers. Now, I'm sure you guys all know what flappers are, but uh, the the vamp thing caught me a little off guard, so I had to do a little research. So let's take a little side note here. Um, the role of mother is vanishing. Uh, wives are not just stay-at-home moms. They now start to actually talk to their husband. How was your day, sweetie? And t- they're, they're more interested in the social aspect of their husband's job instead of just the job itself. Um, birth control becomes a major issue because we start to see women becoming very independent. Remember the college age women going off to England, coming back with these new radical ideas. They get involved in the suffrage movement. Now that suffrage has, has been, uh, successful, uh, now what do they do? Well, they go out and they, they enjoy themselves. So Margaret Sanger leads the way, uh, the pioneer for the birth control movement. She proposes that large families are a cause of poverty and distress and uh, so birth control is a way of solving that. Uh, the flapper is a new type of woman, again, this new college-educated woman. She drinks, she smokes, she dances, she wears seductive clothing, and she wears <gasps> makeup. Oh, my gosh, say so he doesn't sew in public. Uh, short skirts, short haircuts. You can see the, the picture there. The picture is a little cut off, but you can, you can move it up. Um, this is, I, for, I've misplaced the name of this, but it's a famous actress of the 1920s. The vamp. Is a uh, is a movie star with a little va va voom wow wow so um, that's what a vamp is so you take the flapper style and you give her a little sex appeal and that's that's the vamp of the 1920s not to be confused with the vampire of Twilight um, we become a major consumer culture consumption just just becomes part of life well very very materialistic we would rather have abundance or there is abundance rather than scarcity um, the consumers develop this identity as being a con- consumer and this is where the phrase uh, keeping up with the Joneses well did you see so and so they just bought a new refrigerator well we have to go out and get a new refrigerator and then oh did you see so and so down the street they just got a new uh, vacuum cleaner well we got to go out and get a new vacuum cleaner so it becomes a somewhat of a, a competition 
And again, the buying on credit, people who want to keep up with the Joneses may not have the income of the Joneses, but they, they enjoy buying on credit. And as long as life is good, they have no problem uh, buying on credit and paying their uh, monthly installment. <clears throat> uh, we see clashes between the uh, traditional versus the modern. It's going to happen. It continues to happen today. We, you know, you, you know, the older people in your families uh, still don't understand the new ways of life. It's it's nothing new, but you know there was a clash between the old uh, traditional lifestyle with the new developing cosmopolitan lifestyle. And prohibition continues to cause problems. Uh, prohibition had its support from the middle class, the progressives, but it turns out to be uh, a, a an enormous failed experiment. All it did was create organized crime. Um, nothing more than an old... Uh, it, it's looked upon as nothing more than an effort of the older Americans to retain some of their dominance, some of these progressives to keep some of their dominance over the younger people in society. And so we start to see a backlash again, organized crime and increased number of crimes uh, as a result of prohibition. So it's on its way out pretty soon. Essentially, it's a time of optimism, but it's also a time of uh, mean-spirited intolerance. We see a resurgence of the KKK, especially in small towns, uh, towns where change does not come easy, uh, especially in the, in the farming, farming areas. Uh, they see life in the city as a degradation of society, a, a, a ruining of their social and moral values, and they blame it on the minorities, essentially. Politics in this new era are very boring. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was an economic genius, but there really wasn't a lot to do. Uh, the businessmen are the heroes, not the politicians, but we do see, uh, and we do see uh, a decline in voter turnout, but that's just because there wasn't really a lot to, to worry about. There wasn't a lot to change. Um, prohibition, again, is the big issue. Protestants still heard, hold for, firm to their belief, but the Catholics see it as a insult to their lifestyle. So do the Irish, and Catholics and Irish are typically Democrat. And so the Democrats take on this new um, platform of ending prohibition. Uh, by the 1930s, we see a flip-flop. The, the wets had outlaw, outnumbered the dries. That means you know the prohibitionists are now out, uh, uh, outnumbered by those who want to repeal prohibition. And in fact, that's what happens with the 21st Amendment, the, the ending of prohibition. Again, very little activity. Warren G. Harding is a man of limited talents from a small town, <laughs> and he's replaced by Silent Cal. Uh, not that these men were not intelligent and deserving of the office there just wasn't really anything to to worry about uh and do a lot i mean i guess they could have managed um the credit issue a little bit more but at the time it wasn't broken so you know if it's not broken don't fix it so now we do let's move on to the great depression so we've experienced this great and wonderful period of the 20s the roaring 20s as they're so rightly named because everything seemed to be going well into the Great Depression. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the Great Depression was made horrible because of the mass production. We produce so much that, uh, once again, the, the economy becomes saturated. Um, the last time we reproduced some, we re that we produced a lot was uh, during the Industrial Era, and we were lucky enough to have World War I uh, right at the end of that. And I say lucky enough, it seems kind of ironic or uh, oxymoronic to say that, but we were lucky enough because that provided us a market to sell that abundance to. Now we jump through the 20s, and we're mass producing again, and we've saturated the market. There is no overseas market to go to now. Europe's still in shambles. Europe can't buy our excess. So now we see uh, the effects of some of the worst economic disasters in world history. Again, housing slows down because we've built enough houses for everybody who needs one or wants one or can't afford one. Auto construction slows down. Everybody who can afford a car has a car. So when those industries slow down, all of the other industries that are a part of that slow down as well. We do see ups and downs, uh, gains and, and, and falls in the economy. But essentially through the 30s, it's just uh, one big major depression um, until 
1940, well, specifically 41 when we get into the war. During the Great Depression, nationwide unemployment, 25%. It's the lowest average it's ever been. Specifically in cities around Ohio, Cleveland at 50%, Akron at 60 Toledo at 80%. These are auto industries. These are oil industries. Um, these are major industries that provide the United States with major supplies throughout the 20s. And all the workers get laid off. Remember the, uh, the business cycle? 9,000 banks fail, um, $2.5 billion lost. Agriculture is hit the hardest because um, they have loans, farmers have loans to the banks, and uh, when their crops are not selling, they don't have the money to pay back the banks. The banks collect the farms, but they still don't. They still don't have the money to take care to run their bank, so the banks eventually go, uh, go close up as well. Farm income drops. Again, demand is not keeping up with supply. Uh, too much supply, not enough demand. And investment drops. Foreclosures are uh, 10 times more than they were in the 1920s. This depression affected everyone in the United States from the wealthy on down. Now, my father lived through the Great Depression, and... Um, he would often tell me that he, he, he didn't even know there was a depression going on until somebody told him about it. And so for the poorest of the poor, it was like, well, welcome to our world. Now you know what it's like. But uh, everyone was affected. Uh, the, the movie Great Gatsby just was remade recently, uh, but the book itself, um, it's, it's made during this, this time period, during the Great Depression. And yes, the wealthy did suffer some because everyone was hit, but the wealthy made it through because, well, they're, they're wealthy. Uh, in The Great Gatsby, I, one thing that sticks out to me, and I can't remember the female character, but her biggest concern is the, the country homes, uh, done, the air conditioner quit working in the country homes, so let's go to the city and let's stay in that because the air conditioner works. So th that's their biggest concern during the Great Depression is having air conditioning. But again, they were hit in some way, shape, or form. Um, we see migration back to the country to try farming, subsistence farming. Maybe we can grow enough crops to take care of ourselves. Uh, birth rate drops because you don't want to bring a new child into this world when you can't take care of your own life. Same thing with marrying. People get married later because you don't want to be responsible for a, a helpmate or a, a wife or a husband. Uh, we start to see drifters, uh, older uh, male children leave home. Um, not because there's any, not anything there, but to help the family. That'd be one less mouth to feed. So they just ride the rails uh, across the country. And these people later become hobos. But there's a, there's a whole historical study on uh, people riding rails, and that's, that's what they did. And, of course, socialism rears its ugly head once again. See, we told you capitalism is bad. Here's what capitalism does to you. Join the socialist. We'll fix everything. And, no, sorry, they don't. <clears throat> reasons for the depression again lack of purchasing power um, people had confidence in the system while they had work but when they when the work stops and they stop having uh, a paid paycheck uh, then they start to have a lack of confidence in the system people who bought on credit are overextended they don't have a job they can't pay back the credit uh, people are now living below subsistence levels foreign markets can't buy American made goods the European industries have recovered, so they no longer are relying on American industries as much. But still, European uh, the economy is still slow. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, how bad Germany was and how things, how horrible they were in Germany. Um, allied nations, they they really can't pay their loans back to the United States because their economy is is so bad. Uh, in an effort to help. American-made goods, uh, the government passes high tariffs, um, making the European products coming into the country more expensive, again, to encourage people to buy American-made product. The only thing that that does is um, force European countries to put high tariffs on American products. So when we try to sell Model Ts in, in England, they cost so much because of their tariffs uh, no one's buying American made goods there. So American made goods are not selling in Europe. European goods are not being sold in America. American goods are not being sold in America. European goods are not being sold in Europe. Nobody's buying. That's all it is. No one has money. No one's buying. The economy essentially stops, just shuts down. Again, key industries all max out all at the same time. 
the market is saturated people get laid off they don't have work uh, they can't spend and you just go down four five six when, uh, when when less is spent in the economy the economy slows down and when it uh, let's read this less purchasing power means less spent in the economy less spent in the economy causes other business to cut back their employees when employees are cut grandpa gets punched in the stomach over a can of soup don't let grandpa get punched over a can of soup that didn't happen well maybe it did but that's you get the idea Population growth slows. Again, people are not having babies because they don't want to take care of another mouth to feed. And then, you know, the stock market crashes. People already already have a lack of faith in the uh, the economy. And then we have a crash. This the the crash, October 29th, the crash is the third crash. There were two crashes prior to this. The first one, we rebounded pretty quickly, and it gave people a, sh a shock, a big scare, and people pulled out. Not a majority of people pulled out, but people pulled out of the market. The market does rebound. It crashes again. Uh, this time, a few more people pull out, but because it has happened before, a lot of people will stay in because they they believe that since it's happened before and it rebounded, well, that's just how things go. Um, but your 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 short timers, your short term investors, uh, they get out. Your long term, they stick in. Unfortunately, there's not enough long term people to stay in. Finally, the third crash, October 29th, the big one. Prices drop about 50% in five weeks, and, and businesses just go out of business. Uh, stocks uh, are being sold back onto the market at enormously high rates. Uh, stocks that were worth $50 uh, on Monday are now worth $0.50 cents on Tuesday. That's how many shares are being sold back onto the market. One major issue, and I'm not sure if it comes up here in the notes, one major issue for these short-timers uh, the people who are basically playing the game, not the long-term investors, not the J.P. Morgans, you know, the, the, the Joneses who want to make it rich quick. They have borrowed money to invest in the stock market or to play the stock market game. That's called margin buying or buying on margin, where you put up $500 of your own money, but then you borrow $500 from a bank to invest $1,000 total into the stock market. That's all well and good if the stock market is healthy. And if you get into an investment that can make you a quick uh, and turn around on your investment, then you can pay that $500 back to the bank. Unfortunately, the the turnaround was not that quick. So when the market crashes, all of those people who bought on margin owed all that money back to the banks. And with the market crashing and the jobs uh, ending and banks failing and businesses shutting down, those people lost their jobs. So they had no money to pay the bank. So they lost their homes. We see foreclosures increasing. And we also uh, see banks closing down again because they can't collect. It doesn't matter if they can foreclose on a home and take possession of the home. No one's going to buy that home from them. So we see all of that. Uh, it all It's a domino effect, essentially. The government's reaction. Uh, President Hoover um, institutes job creation programs. Hoover was not a fan of the welfare style system but he did believe in helping and uh, two of his big programs often overlooked are the creation of Boulder Dam and the electrification of the area out there and that's what Boulder Dam was designed to do was to electrify that area of Colorado and Arizona um, does not provide direct relief because um, that's not the job of the federal government that's not uh, Hoover does not believe that's the federal government's role that's that's a state role but he did create um, the Boulder Dam project. It is now called Hoover Dam in honor of uh, President Hoover. And yes, that's where the, the Autobots keep their little secret box. Again, Hoover does not believe in direct relief. Uh, 1932 rolls around and um, people start waiting for the government to do something. Now, remember, this is the government of laissez-faire. The only, the only two instances of government regulation are Interstate Commerce Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act, but now people are looking to the federal government to actually do something. Well, with the uh, 1932 election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or federal direct relief, um, he promises to do something. And in New York City, he instituted his own New, new Deal policies for the state, but uh, he takes that message to the nation and uh, wins the election. People have a change of ideas or a change of heart or a change of uh, mentality, so to speak, they go from expecting the government to have nothing to do or very little to do with their lives to, you know, when are you going to buy me a phone? Oh, wait, no, that's now. How much are you going to do for me?
That's the mentality change. Comparing Hoover to Roosevelt is uh, something you'll need to do in an upcoming lesson, but you can see here his first approach is to urge voluntary cooperation from um, local charities, churches, and things like that. Uh, in the game Monopoly, there's a community chest. Hoover encouraged all cities of, of decent size to create a community chest for which to help out their uh, ind individual citizens. Congress does ask for uh, $423 million in budget increases for works program. Um, again, encouraging state and lo local governments. Very important because Hoover focuses on the state and local government aspect. It's the state and local government's job to provide relief, not the federal government. Um, but we do get a budget increase to help these state and local governments. Um, but he still focuses on and he maintains a balanced budget, which is something unheard of. He proposes an Agricultural Market Act which uh, plans to help with uh, farm prices. See, if farm prices were so low, this Agricultural Market Act would help by uh, purchasing the surplus crops, and then that would increase the price of crops. Some farmers could see a little relief there. Um, high tariffs, again, the Holly Smoot Tariff Act causes high tariffs, but that caused that was a negative effect because uh, we weren't, no one could buy anything, and then, the European countries reciprocated by passing their own high tariff. And a $1.5 million public works program. Now this is all Hoover. So if you were to take Hoover's name off of this uh, set of notes right here and just read through this, this would look a lot like the New Deal programs. Uh, Hoover is often criticized for not doing enough. But again, look, look through all this list. This looks almost identical to New Deal programs. The only thing different between Hoover and Roosevelt is that Hoover was not in the business of providing direct relief. He did not believe it was the federal government's job to provide relief at all. That's a state and local uh, government. Um, I think this website might give you some idea on different uh, housing, what housing looked like back in the day. Guys, thanks a lot. Talk to you later.